thank you, Helen. Yes, I'll be talking about photon assay and fire assay today. Um, my presentation has a bit of a mind of its own, so I apologize if it goes on without me. Um, but this is a new technique that we're offering, offering in Canning Vale at Min Analytical, and um, I wanted to dis describe a little bit about how it compares to the traditional fire assay as well. So fire assay, Richard already gave a bit of an introduction to the technique itself. Um, it requires fluxing, which is known a little bit more as alchemy than science because it requires a knowledge of the matrix of the materials itself. Um, a fusion, you create buttons, you um, uh, melt those buttons, you create prills, you do a digestion, you do instrumentation, and it requires a fairly uh, decent sized team of technical people that know what they're doing uh, throughout the entire stage of the process. The new, uh, when it decides to move on. <laughs> okay, there we go. The new photon assay technique um, is a far simplified process with a lot more automation involved. So it starts off as a batching process where operators log the samples into a system using nothing but barcodes. There's no hand entry. They scan the jars of the samples. They scan the sample IDs. They place it on the balance and the weight's automatically transferred. And you'll see the little box with the light around it. And what this has, it has a CCD camera and some LEDs, and it measures how full the jar is itself. And that's used to help calculate the concentration of the gold within the jar. It's placed onto the conveyor belt, it's gone into the instrument, and it comes back out two hours later with a series of data, and you box it up and you move on. This only requires about one person per shift, and it doesn't require somebody to be dedicated to it, as the conveyor going into the instrument holds about 160 samples, which is roughly two hours of work. So what's this instrument doing inside of it? Well, it's using an electronic high energy X-ray source. So although it has a name similarity X-ray fluorescence, this is a highly penetrating technique that's bordering on gamma ray analysis, irradiating the nucleus of the gold atoms themselves. So it, the sample goes into the jar. The jar itself gets paired with a reference disk, which has an internal standard. Both pairs get irradiated. They go through the chamber in the back, come back out, go into a chamber with two semiconductor electrically cooled detectors, one on the top, one on the bottom, and each sample goes through two different cycles. In that process, there's a number of quality checks that the samples do as well making sure that both of those detectors are roughly receiving a similar signal. It goes and looks at the clarity of the spectra itself, and it also looks to see that those two cycles uh, also have relatively similar information. And also, if there's a high background of other radiative materials like thorium and uranium, it won't bother analyzing them again. It will just kick it out and say, I can't do it. So in this process, we've gone through a very extensive uh, validation. I don't expect you to actually read this. It's pretty much summarized here. But this is a modified version of Francois Bongasson's uh, sampling tree method, where we've gone through and taken uh, samples from 11 different drill sites across six different companies. And we've crushed them at various different particle size, pulverized them, and submitted them to the instrument for comparison. A lot of our work focused around these two sizes, the Boyd Crush at three, two to three millimeters and pulverizing, which is what you typically do a fire assay technique on. Now with only 10 minutes, I can't really go too much into this, but if people are more interested, please just come see us. But one case study of this was a coarse gold deposit where we received 63 samples of drill core. We analyzed two jars of photon assay at roughly three millimeters, uh, roughly containing 400 to 500 grams of sample. Then we pulverized the remaining of the material, created a pulp packet and um, did five replicates on that. Then we went back to the photon assay jars themselves, pulverized that material, resubmitted it to photon assay because it's non-destructive, and then did uh, fire assays again on those materials. So overall, what we found is when you do means comparison tests, bivariance analysis, and a variety of any other statistical technique anybody could come up with, we found that they were 
So here I've shown what's called the connecting circles report, where if the two circles are touching relatively, then you can see that the two analysis techniques match. The difference between the Tukey Kramers and a student t-test, which is more traditional, is that the, par the number of samples doesn't have to be identical in a Tukey Kramers. Now, this material, like I said, was from a coarse gold deposit. So one way of identifying that is by looking at the grade versus the difference between either one jar and another or one fire assay and another, and it steeply climbs. Another way of looking at that is by using relative differences or percent variations on that, and you can see it steadily climbs, where a standard deposit would look something like this. So you can see that the two are very different. So the first thing that we did is about six weeks apart, we ran the same three millimeter jars through the instrument to make sure that we get the same result no matter when we run them or who analyzes them. The, the overall, the correlation is very good. Not everybody is happy with correlation coefficients. So down at the bottom is the difference between the analysis, which is also very small, and a bivariant analysis returns a null result, suggesting that the two, tech, the two samples presented are virtually identical which is what we would expect. So uh, like did the photon assay, two passes on the three millimeter material. We did do fire assays on two different splits of the material. We reanalyzed the materials from the photon assay from the same jars at three millimeter and then again at 75 micron. And then we also did screen fire assay, but you can see there's only four results there. And overall, in comparison to all of these techniques, we got very comparable results, uh, no matter how we looked at the material and even in the worst case scenarios. So overall, we found that the two techniques could be used interchangeably uh, for, for the same resource if required. So the two techniques do have their uh, pluses and minuses and benefits in, in different situations. So the photon assay allows for a bulk analysis. So it's replacing your screen fire assays or um, really high volume blag type samples where you could submit each jar is about 500 grams a sample, but it, the jars themselves require to be filled at least 50%. So it does absolutely require to have that larger sample size, whereas a fire assay allows for a bit more variability. The photon assay um, is a relatively fast turnaround. Once we submit a sample to the instrument itself, you can get a result within five minutes. So um, in comparison to a fire assay where I think the fastest you could probably get a result is about 12 hours in most cases. A photon assay is not affected by the traditional problem elements for fire assay of high nickel, copper, or sulfur, and no modifications for these elements are required. However, the photon assay being a radiative technique does require um, that the thorium, uranium, and even barium not be too high, or um, it will cause interferences on the gold and reduce the chances of being able to go to good detection limit. The photon assay obviously requires a lot less operators and it also doesn't require the operators to have as many technical skills because the machine itself knows pretty much what it's doing and it's got even an email system so when it thinks something's gone wrong it emails the whole technical team so that somebody can go and figure out what's going on. Photon assay also has a much higher upper detection limit. Um, we've been able to analyze e materials up over a percentage. It can handle it. Currently, it's only validated up to 350 ppm. But without having to switch out or do anything extra, we can um, look at much higher concentrations. But the photon assay tends to have a detection limit down around 0.02 or 0.03 ppm, which can be high for some people. So fire assay still has a much better precision at the lower concentrations due to it being a concentrative technique. So overall, the two techniques um, can produce similar results in certain situations, and each may still have a place in geology at the moment. Thank you very much. <laughs>